Art Fellowship and the National Science Foundation Career Award, very early in her career also, and an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship. She has a PhD from the Cornell University. So Professor Roos, the floor is yours. You are going to speak about the AI, artificial intelligence, and the impact on the future world. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you, Diana, for this wonderful introduction, um, this very kind introduction. Um, so let me see if I can um, do screen share. Um, I have uh, done that. Um, let's see. Uh, one second. I was uh, I was just on the I just want to make sure I get the right um, video. Sorry, uh, Daniela, if it's yeah. possible to yes, if it's possible only to share the presentation, not the full screen, because like that we can see yes, also you. Uh, yes, yes. I uh, excuse me, just a second. Don't I worry. was not at the beginning of my talk. Okay, so um, back to screen sharing. Um, sorry about that. Okay, this is the talk and uh, share and there we go. Perfect. Um, Thank you so much. So okay. the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I am a roboticist and I usually get two types of um, reactions when I tell people that I work in AI and robotics. Um, some people get very nervous and they make jokes about Skynet and they ask, when will the robots take over their jobs? And then there's the other group that gets wildly excited and asks me, uh, when can they offload uh, all their work to machines and when will their car be self-driving? Now, I believe that everyone stands to benefit from AI, but it's very important to understand the fears of that first group and provide solutions and perspectives on how to see things differently. And this starts with understanding that AI is just a tool. Um, it's an incredibly powerful tool, uh, but like any other tool, it isn't good or bad. It's what we choose to do with it. And we can do so many extraordinary things. We can ensure that uh, our roads are safe and there are no road uh, fatalities in the future. We can better engineer medicines and we can better monitor and treat disease. We can keep your information private and safe. Um, altogether, we can offload routine tasks to machines um, and uh, allow people the time to do creative uh, thinking, um, to do thinking about um, strategy. And this progress is enabled by three interrelated uh, fields. On one hand, we have robotics and robotics, you can think of it as a field that puts computation in motion and gives machines autonomy. And then we have artificial intelligence um, and um, this field uh, works on giving machines the ability um, to see, um, to, um, to communicate like humans. In other words, the ability to reason. And then we have machine learning. And machine learning aims to learn from and make predictions on data. And uh, all these technologies have such tremendous uh, potential impact. Um, and this impact can be classified as um, supporting people with tools uh, for, um, uh, for AI at rest, in other words, cognitive tools and supporting people with tools for physical motion. Now, every field uh, can benefit uh, if the field has data. For example, medicine um, uh, is a very powerful example because machines today can um, look at more uh, data, more medical tests um, in a day than doctors can see in a lifetime. And um, this is exactly the, uh, the case for a field such as radiology, uh, where machines today can look at more radiology scans in a day uh, than a, a radiologist might see in an entire lifetime. Now, an AI-based approach was tasked with reviewing images 
of lymph node cells and uh, diagnose cancer or not cancer. On its own, the machine had an error rate of 7.5%, which is much worse than the human's error at 3.5%. But when both the AI system and the human pathologist reviewed the data together, um, the error went down to 0.5%, which is an 80% uh, improvement. And this is extraordinary. Now, today, uh, these systems may be deployed in some of the most advanced um, cancer hospitals uh, around the world. But imagine a future when every practitioner, even those working on small practices in rural settings, uh, have access to these systems. Uh, for example, an overworked doctor may not have the time to review every new uh, clinical trial. But working with these systems, the doctor will be able to offer patients the most cutting edge diagnosis and treatment options. And in the future, this might mean customized healthcare. It might mean um, uh, using the knowledge gleaned from enormous amounts of data and making that knowledge relevant to the patient today. Now, machines and people working together is critical. And machines and people working together can be better in so many other fields. For example, machines and people can, uh, working together can be better financial analysts. And um, I like to tell people that they should imagine uh, the AI system uh, like an assistant or an intern answering simple questions, running around, um, uh, pouring over data and uh, finding patterns and, uh, and um, predictions to be interpreted by an expert. Machine learning algorithms can construct uh, trading patterns based on prior experience, and they can suggest better investment uh, portfolios and assets. And um, these systems uh, may have predictive capabilities that make them ready for a change even before that change actually happens uh, in the market. Similarly, machines and humans working together can be better lawyers. Now we already have tools uh, that have revolutionized um, law practice. And uh, this is word processing, the internet and email. Uh, because these have revolutionized document dra drafting, access to information, and sharing information. These innovations changed the law practice in fundamental ways. And the next wave of technologies, uh, natural language uh, processing, promises similarly far-reaching effects. Because by interpreting natural language processing um, systems will predict decisions to support the work of lawyers. Uh, these systems will be able to read and uh, memorize entire libraries of cases and identify the most relevant prior cases and decisions given the current evidence. However, while software has replaced some tasks related to document review, document drafting and research, Computers can't counsel clients, they can't write compelling briefs, and they can't persuade judges. So again, machines can be in supportive roles for people to do their jobs better. Now, the same principle applies um, to the work of teachers who could use the latest advances to support preparation and automatic grading of some assignments. And at the moment, uh, teachers spend at least a fifth of their time grading. And with AI systems, they can test a little, a little more, uh, grade a little less, and have more time to spend with the students. Now, machines and people working together can also make better transportation systems. And I want to show you a result from uh, a, a project from my research group where we developed a new anytime optimal algorithm that uh, for matching supply and demand. 
And this algorithm is scalable and can handle thousands of jobs in real time. The algorithm can be applied to any field where you have to match supply and demand. For instance, manufacturing, supply chain, or transportation. Well, we implemented the system um, for the taxi data set that, um, is, um, uh, that is generated on a daily basis in New York City. And so in New York City, there are about 400 um, taxi requests every day. And these requests are met by 14,000 taxis. So our algorithm has been able to increase the efficiency of the system uh, tremendously because we have shown uh, that with 3,000 vehicles, 3,000 taxis, of capacity four, that means at most four people in the taxi, um, we can meet 90% of the demand uh, of transportation in New York City that's currently served by 14,000 taxis um, with a guaranteed trip delay of less than three minutes. And this is tremendous. Now capacity four cars means that vehicles can pull up to four different trips provided that they're all uh, going uh, in roughly the same direction. So we do not uh, increase the waiting time of people. So a natural question is, does this mean that 10,000 taxi drivers will be out of a job in the future? And the answer is that a new uh, we, ha we have new perspectives. And the new perspective is to change the business model. And so if the drivers were to agree to be agents in the system and follow the directions of the system um, and customers agree to abide by the system rules, we can imagine a solution that keeps the same drivers and gives them shorter shifts for the same wages because the same uh, demand exists in the system. And getting cars off the road means improved quality of life. Uh, it means uh, better um, traffic. It means lower pollution. Um, it means a better city life. And um, in the process of doing this, uh, we also generate uh, new jobs because uh, these uh, taxi management systems uh, generate jobs to develop, maintain, and uh, deploy uh, the service. Now, in the future, the taxis could become autonomous and this would change the job landscape. But we have some time to consider um, this uh, issue because level four autonomy is not quite ready for the public roads. And, um, but, but the technology is uh, actually ready for um, lower complexity environments. Like for example, in this case where we have deployed uh, a similar service to so taxi service uh, in Singapore at the Chinese uh, garden. And this technology can have immediate um, societal benefits. Uh, people were very happy to, um, uh, to use the service and um, they, uh, uh, they really saw opportunities for using the service in hospitals, in retirement communities uh, for food um, deliveries. And by the way, uh, this experiment was done in 2012. This is eight years ago. Uh, since then, a lot has, uh, has happened uh, in autonomous driving. Uh, but I wanted to show you this particular video because, um, uh, because I want to uh, explain to you how this technology for autonomy might be able to give uh, Bob, who's currently retired, uh, and does not go to many uh, places outside his home, this technology might be able to give Bob a higher quality of life in his retirement. And so say Bob wants to go to the park to see his friend Alice or to feed the fish and the birds. Well, in the future, Bob um, would simply bring up uh, this You Got Wheels interface uh, pick up the type of vehicle that suits him today, a mini shuttle, to, uh, tomorrow a shopping cart or a scooter. And when the robot arrives, uh, Bob gets a call 
uh, he heads out and, um, and is off. And although the robot car has no driver, we should not view this as displacing work since the service does not exist today. However, this UGOT wheels uh, will employ many engineers to design, build, and service the system, and Bob will have a higher quality of life. Now, you should know that mobility can come in many different packages. And um, for instance, it could be wheelchairs, it could be cars, it could be buses, it could be shuttles. Uh, everything that is on wheels uh, can be turned into an autonomous system uh, with today's technology that enables so many services. This is an example of a wheelchair we built at MIT. Moreover, the same technology for autonomous driving can be mapped onto wearables to provide safe navigation and situation awareness to blind and visually impaired users. And um, this is done by taking the sensors traditionally used in an autonomous vehicle, uh, for example, a camera and a laser scanner and uh, mapping them onto wearables. Uh, in this case, our wearable user has a necklace with a camera embedded in it and a belt uh, with uh, laser scanners and um, um, braille buckle uh, that allows the blind user an active interface uh, with the world. The combination camera and laser scanner can look at the world, understand it, and present it to the user in this, uh, with, a, uh, with the use of this programmable um, braille buckle. And so, for instance, um, the technology can be used to say, hey, um, there is an obstacle behind you. Or the technology can be used to say, hey, there is your friend Alice is passing by. Or um, the technology can be used to describe a fabulous window display. And so um, here is actually an, um, a development uh, of this technology. Um, that we have um, and an implementation of this technology that we have made um, uh, at MIT and our blind user is able to use the braille buckle to find a bench to sit on it and feed the ducks. So the same technology that is used for autonomous uh, navigation can be used to facilitate robotaxi, but that will not come for a long time. It can be used to enable blind users to experience the world in better ways. It can be used to do deliveries of, uh, uh, of uh, goods. Uh, it can be used to, um, to deliver medicines in hospitals. Uh, it can be used to support people in their retirement um, communities, in their retirement, um, in, in their lives. So uh, let's see. Now, much of this technology uh, is actually enabled uh, by, a, uh, by a technique um, uh, developed in machine learning uh, called uh, deep neural networks. And um, deep neural networks um, are, in fact, um, a particular type of machine learning. Um, they use data, usually millions of hand-labeled examples, to determine the weights that correspond to each node in a convolutional neural network um, so that uh, when a new input uh, is given um, to the network, for example, um, this, um, this um, unlabeled image of a beach, um, the system uh, can say, oh, this is a beach. I have seen other similar uh, pictures and I can recognize this picture as a, be uh, as a beach. Now, deep learning has enabled a lot of new applications, but there are significant limitations that need to be overcome for the next wave of machine learning. And so, for instance, if you look at these two pictures, um, uh, they are uh, there are two pictures of the same dog, but in fact, there are very subtle differences between them. Uh, you can see the pixel differences um, right here in the uh, in the middle. Um, these two dogs are so similar that I can't tell any difference between um, the, the pixels. But this, um, 
But this perturbation is enough to trick a, ne a network that recognizes the first picture correctly as a dog um, to recognize the set same picture as an ostrich. And um, this is a, a well-known limitation uh, in machine learning uh, and in deep learning today. Now, moreover, deep learning also lacks common sense. So let's take a look at this video. Um, now, this video um, is, uh, uh, is taken, it's an experiment uh, with an 18 month old. Um, you can see the child in the, uh, in the corner. This child has not seen this, um, this adult and this task ever. And yet the child is able to figure out what the adult wanted. And on top of that, the child is able to issue a command to help the adult. So again, the child is seeing this person for the first time, is seeing the task for the first time, and yet the child is able to reason and um, is able to, um, to tell the adult almost uh, through, uh, through eye contact, did I understand you correctly? Have I, have I been able to help you? And so this is absolutely extraordinary. And we can take as a grand challenge for AI um, to develop the, the tools, um, the technology that will help machines understand um, in that, that would actually help us understand what is happening in the brain of this 18 month old and how might we be able to use that understanding to make more uh, capable machines. So um, we also need to understand what it means for AI to recognize this picture as a beach. So what it means uh, is, um, is that the pixels in this image look like the pixels in other images that people labeled as beach. But the system does not really know what a beach is. It doesn't know what the sand feels when you step on it. It doesn't know what you do with a beach. It doesn't know what the purpose of the beach is. And so the, the semantic understanding of our machine learning systems uh, is still quite limited today. In other words, uh, today we have significant challenges with machine learning. Uh, first of all, Supervised learning requires a massive data labeling step. And um, the machine learning systems work only as well as the data used to train them. Um, so obtaining massive data sets is a challenge. Moreover, uh, these systems are not able to explain how they reach their co conclusion. Uh, they cannot extrapolate, They're not, um, they, they do not generalize. Um, they are, uh, if there is bias in the data and the algorithms, the algorithm will have bias. In other words, if you have bad data, the system will produce bad answers. And the systems la uh, lack common reasoning. Finally, um, learning does not uh, mean an anthropomorphized version of learning. Uh, learning means uh, matching uh, for these systems. Moreover, we mostly have one-off solutions. We have no universal uh, tools and we have primarily machine learning by experts. Uh, we are uh, increasing our education um, uh, materials and our approach to education uh, to the point where, uh, the, uh, where machine learning can be taught uh, broadly. And when we get to that point, uh, we will have a transformation uh, on the workforce. However, I also want to say that crunching large data does not translate into knowledge and uh, doing complex calculations does not produce autonomy. Much more is needed uh, for knowledge and for autonomy. And so what does that mean today? Well, that means that we have a great deal of opportunities, but we have to figure out uh, the sweet spot for, um, for this opportunity. And in particular, the opportunities are around personalization and customization. The opportunities are for democratizing uh, access um, to these technologies uh, through education. 
Uh, the opportunities are also in the field of natural language interpretation, um, where the, uh, the advancements are growing exponentially. Altogether, uh, the opportunities are for machines and people working together um, with machines um, taking on the routine tasks and increasing the efficiency and quality time of people. And um, this brings us um, to, to jobs. So I would say that today AI um, has limitations and these limitations hold AI systems, they hold machines back from outthinking humanity and uh, also from displacing people in many jobs. Now, here in this table, I'm showing four types of jobs according to the required skill and cognition. And our state-of-the-art AI cannot displace anybody in the top row in the near future. And in addition, robots will struggle with physical tasks that um, require unpredictable movement or fine motor skills. It will be some time until we will have robots that will clear your tabletop after dinner. But ultimately machines may replace the repetitive tasks that you see for the job categories in the middle. But I should tell you that even apparently highly vulnerable occupations such as bookkeeping and accountancy generally involve very critical social interactions that are not possible to do with machines today. And this should suggest that we should examine tasks rather than occupations because people in all occupations uh, spend time doing different types of activities. For example, they interact with other people, they apply expertise, uh, they do data processing, and they do predictable and unpredictable physical um, work. And so what you see uh, on this chart um, is um, uh, data from a McKinsey study that highlights these typical activities in different jobs. And the color indicates technical feasibility for automation, ranging from no in red to yes in blue. And the size of the bubble shows how much time people spend in that type of activity. And um, so note that every, each profession surveyed here, accommodation and food services, manufacturing, agriculture, transportation and warehousing, re retail trade, mining, construction, utilities, wholesale trade, finance and insurance, arts and entertainment, uh, real estate, administrative, all these professions spend different amounts of time in all these different types of jobs. And so I think that um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of exciting to think about the fact that we have the possibility of improving each type of profession uh, with AI and machine learning and robotics tools. And so what I wanted to tell you that is that while it is easier to think about what jobs might go away, it is much harder to imagine what will come back. And so for example, agricultural em employment uh, dropped from 41% um, to 2% in the 20th century, but nobody predicted this in the 19th century. But the new service jobs that came instead of agriculture provided many more opportunities in the number of jobs and the quality of jobs later in the 20th century. So people continue to have things to do. A similar effect can be seen in locomotive versus aircraft uh, jobs. Uh, and here with air travel going up and tra uh, train travel going up, uh, you can see the trend. Now, um, this chart is for the United States and um, you see on this chart that in the 20th century, the unemployment rate remained relatively constant at around 5.8% uh, average, um, while the GDP grew exponentially. And most important, it is much easier to predict the tasks that may be automated than to imagine 
the ones that will be created. So if you think about it, these jobs, the jobs that are listed on this chart did not exist 10 years ago. These jobs were enabled because we introduced the smartphone, we introduced uh, cloud computing, um, we um, introduced uh, social media. Think about the fact that none of these fields existed uh, 10, 15 years ago, and we have had so much trans uh, transformation uh, in our society and in our economy uh, because of these technological uh, contributions. On-demand economy is also providing a lot of opportunity and source of work. And here you can see the growth for companies like Uber, Etsy, and uh, Airbnb and DoorDash. Um, and these companies are employing so many people. Now, what's interesting is to see that all these jobs are concentrating in urban areas, um, uh, which are also technology centers. Um, and this has an impact on how we think about uh, the world in the future and how we get organized. This also has an impact on what, what technologies uh, will be important and necessary uh, to manage the concentration of population around urban areas. It is predicted that by 2050, um, seven in 10 people uh, will live uh, in an urban center. So what can we do? Um, what can we do to get ready for this future? Well, in the short term, we can help people get new skills um, through education programs. And uh, I am a big fan of um, the positive results from, um, uh, from um, focus programs uh, that have taken this path. Uh, for example, a web and software design company based out of uh, Kentucky made a conscious choice to hire former coal miners and train them to write code. So they moved from coal mining to data mining. And uh, the miners uh, are uh, very excited about the new jobs. Now, this is a small program, uh, but imagine if we put in place policies that support and incentivize this kind of retraining in a much broader way and create a safety net for everyone dealing um, with uh, AI um, and technological uh, transition. In the long run, uh, we can also declare computational thinking as the fourth pillar of literacy and introduce mandatory CS education in all schools. Many schools um, in China, uh, many, sorry, not schools, many countries, um, China, the United Kingdom, South Korea, Japan, um, several European countries uh, have already uh, began to introduce uh, this um, uh, computer science uh, in, uh, in their curricula. And I believe that this is absolutely critical for thriving in the, um, in the 21st century. And uh, if we start it today, in 10 years time, we will have a very well-trained uh, workforce. Now, I would like to pause for a minute and recognize that the past three months have been extraordinary for the entire world. Uh, we have, and, and I'm referring to the pan pandemic that has completely upended how, uh, how we approach everything. Um, I, uh, in the words of Satya Nadella, we have seen two years of digital transformation in two months. Um, this means that we are accelerating the rate at which, trans uh, um, uh, at which um, the technology uh, revolution is uh, taking over the world. Uh, people are using technology much more than before. Uh, people are becoming more uh, confident uh, with the tools that they have available uh, for various activities that normally people have done uh, in person. And so, for instance, uh, COVID has had huge impact uh, in uh, three areas in particular, um, in digital commerce, in telemedicine, and in automation. Um, so I, I see COVID-19 uh, as a potential turning point 
in the use and adoption of technology. So uh, in recent studies, uh, we have seen huge increase in online shopping. And uh, for instance, um, this, this is a particular data point from Italy, um, but all countries have uh, similar trends. 81% in increase uh, in online uh, shopping in Italy. Uh, also, we have seen the rise of delivery services in the United States. Uh, we have seen Amazon, Instacart, and DoorDash uh, that have been completely maxed out uh, in, uh, in the services that they offer. And uh, this, this indicates to us that this is such a, um, such a fertile field uh, for more growth. And uh, this field, uh, this, the, this growth though, requires the education, the training, so people can have the tools uh, to develop the new services. Um, uh, similarly, telemedicine has seen a huge increase. Uh, Teledoc Health in the US has seen 50% increase in doctor registrations in March. And we have had similar uh, uh, rates of increase uh, in virtualized medical services uh, in the um, EU. Uh, we also believe that um, uh, the, with, the, um, with people working from home, uh, there is increasingly more need for automating tasks. And uh, this will have a huge impact on many jobs uh, by um, the, uh, the end of the next, uh, de uh, by the end of the decade. I believe that virtualization will continue to be used uh, even after the pandemic. And this in itself uh, is opening um, uh, the, the potential uh, for so many technologies uh, that are currently developed in the context of virtualization, of augmented reality, uh, of digital support and digital services, of computer graphics. And so I expect uh, a lot of increase uh, in uh, both the scientific and economic activity in the space. And this requires that we target our education programs to prepare people to contribute uh, in uh, these areas. So with this, uh, I would like to um, show you this, um, uh, this uh, final slide um, that, um, Essential, that, that has a number of uh, newspaper articles uh, from the past 100 years and shows you that in fact, the fear of machines taking over uh, is not a new phenomenon. Um, this fear has been with us uh, for centuries and uh, it goes back to what I have been saying from the, at, at the beginning of the talk that um, we have the fear and we have the excitement of technology. And these have been with us for a long time. And uh, at the same time, we have the tools, we have the technology uh, that is empowering us uh, to be creative, um, to solve the problems. And in the process of doing that, we create uh, new jobs. And now I promise you, this is the last uh, thing I'm gonna show you as part of the presentation. Uh, this is a quote I like a lot uh, from John Kennedy, who is our hometown hero here in Boston. And in the 1960s, in particular in 1962, he said, if men have the talent to invent machines that put men out of work, they have the talent to put those men back to work. And I almost completely agree uh, with uh, John's uh, sentiments except I would like to change men to men and women uh, because we all have the ability uh, to be creative and uh, to contribute to the advancement of technology. And with this, I would like to stop the presentation and uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to address questions. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Daniela. This was really amazing. And you cannot believe how many questions you have now. And uh, also quite a lot of praise uh, from everybody here. It's uh, a great presentation. Very clear, very loud, even for non-scientific or non-IE person, easy to understand. And I would like uh, just briefly to stay over your last quote and your last uh, idea. In fact, uh, I strongly believe the same. I also teach my students the same thing that uh, never be afraid. I show them even from Gutenberg, you know, 
when uh, the book, uh, the first printing book, book was done, that it was the same fear, don't fear of the technology. If you use it correctly and wisely, it's going to help you. So uh, there are a lot of questions about ethics and also about how you can prepare, in fact, uh, the world to take over, to, to be responsive to the uh, AI. One is specifically is about uh, how you can, what is the most, the main ethical issue and concern related to AI. There are a lot, but you need to pick one. <laughs> you know, education people don't ask easy questions. <laughs> Uh, uh, j just one. Um, so, um, I have too many, um, uh, but I, um, I would say that um, uh, fairness uh, is a very important thing to consider when we, uh, when we develop our algorithms, because you see, um, the computer science um, uh, community who has been hard at work developing the capabilities that empower um, these machines. Um, uh, the, the computer science community has been primarily focused on two criteria. How much time does it take to, um, to uh, run the algorithm? And how much space do I need to run the algorithm? And, um, and these questions were really foundational as we developed the computer science field. However, today we are uh, putting these machines um, into, into, the, uh, into the real world. And we're getting these machines to process increasingly uh, in support of applications that impact people. And so it's super important um, that uh, the machines uh, operate in a fair way. And in fact, fairness uh, has become an important new criterion, an important new metric uh, for developing uh, algorithms. Um, it's, it's interesting because we think of fairness, we think of human, we think of fairness as a kind of a human right. And, um, I, uh, I, I, and it's, it's kind of hard uh, to, uh, to figure out what are the correct mathematical models uh, that incorporate uh, this, this notion of, of fairness in how the algorithm um, uh, performs. And we want to make sure that if we use an algorithm uh, let's say to um, uh, to recommend whether a loan should be given or not, the algorithm be fair, and at the same time the algorithm have support. If the if the loan is denied, why, um, right? Uh, if um, if the machine is used to support the diagnosis, we also want for that diagnosis to be um, uh, fair in the sense of of. Um, of providing, um, of, of having the system provide the right, the correct answer uh, for the for the same context, and um, if there is a diagnosis, we also want to be able to have an explanation uh, for that diagnosis. And so, fairness as a human rights, as a as an important aspect of algorithmic development, is super important. And now, since I have the floor, I'm going to sneak in another aspect, and I'm going to sneak in privacy. Um, because um, privacy uh, is so important uh, in, um, in how we deal with data and how we deal with algorithms uh, that rely on personal data to, um, to, support, um, uh, to support new capabilities. Um, everything in machine learning is data driven. So worrying about privacy is super important. At the same time, we should think of privacy as a human right. And uh, we, should, um, we should figure out how um, with technology we can begin to assure people uh, that if they give their data for the greater good, uh, they will not be in danger of any um, breach of privacy and any consequences uh, that come with that. Yes, that's very right. And in fact, I'm there with you. And there were a comment also here that quite a lot of ethics is based on humans. So AI by itself, even that it take, can take decisions in fact, it really cannot do more than it was somehow planned by human and what the human allowed uh, in terms of rules uh, for it to, to take decisions of. So it's the humans who are doing it uh, usually and who are responsible for the ethics. Um, I have another question. I will move on because we have only about 10, 11 minutes left into this session. And I know you have a very busy day today in, in MIT. 
is that a lot of questions are about the AI use in education and mainly the use in evaluation, in students' evaluation and into educational methodologies and so on, and that impact which can have also on students and also on professors. So what's your take on this? I think there is a huge opportunity to use uh, AI in education. Um, there is a huge opportunity to rely on, um, on machines to support both the students and the, and the teachers um, with some of the tasks that are taking a huge amount of time uh, today. I mean, ultimately, what we would like to have uh, for education is a it's almost like a customized approach to uh, to learning and uh, teachers are are so um, uh, overburdened um, with large classrooms and large volumes of papers that they need to um, uh, read and evaluate that they don't have the time to treat every student um, individually to to pay enough attention to every student and so with AI technology um, we can uh, better uh, a model and describe how a student learns and we can um, we can then uh, as, uh, associate a different level of um, of um, assignment according to where the student is uh, in the learning process if a student uh, has learned the concept uh, and uh, is um, uh, is very um, has become an expert then the student will be bored uh, if that student gets the same level of questions. The student should be advanced. At the same time, if a student uh, is uh, lacking um, in, uh, in the understanding, then the student needs to continue practicing. And so this kind of, of uh, differentiated um, assignment uh, is, is very um, valuable in supporting learning. At the same time, for teachers, teachers spend a huge amount of time grading. Uh, at least in the United States, they spend 20% of their time grading. Now with machines, with AI systems, uh, the, student, uh, the, the teachers uh, could, um, could offload um, some of the routine grading aspects to machines. And then that time comes back for, uh, the, uh, and that time could be used for planning different lectures for, um, for um, uh, spending time uh, with students one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I, I should say that I, I want to say a couple of other things uh, about <laughs> education since you're asking me um, about that. I really believe that it's super important for all the students um, uh, in the world, everyone, boys and girls, um, um, students of every, every grade to learn about computational thinking. This is uh, broadly computer science, but it's not a particular programming language. It's how to solve problems with computing, but also to learn about making, also to learn about electronics, to learn about design, to learn about um, uh, mechanisms. Because I believe that those of us uh, who know how to make things and then who can breathe life into the things we make uh, through programming, have in some sense superpowers because we can make real anything we imagine. And as a roboticist, my question is who wouldn't want to do this? Um, so all your dreams can come true if you know how to make things and if you know how to program them. And this is why I believe computational thinking and computational making should be right there uh, next to uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and should be considered part of um, of what is core uh, for education. I need to say I'm here with you on this. I strongly believe uh, we've been doing a lot of projects here in computational thinking and how to encourage that development even from quite an early age. And quite a lot of people think that this means using a lot of computers or mobile phones and so on. And it's not necessarily a lot of computational thinking and the method of logic of doing that can happen outside of the mobile phone, for example. The mobile phone is exactly the worst example for computational thinking, in fact, and uh, robots and so on. And we have a group here in Timisoara from the high schools, which even won several awards. They were doing some programming for the ISIS, uh, um, how to say, the space uh, uh, station, international space station programming uh, 
for a robot to move there from here. So, and they were only 12 to 14 years old. So that's, that's a proof that it can be done. A lot of examples and a lot of ideas here on a good example, how you can learn AI. If you have a good program for learning AI and how AI can be learned easy. That's the biggest question, I think. Well, I think that um, you first need to learn about computational thinking because AI is, a, is a, an aspect of computing. And so it's very important to understand uh, the basics of computing. Um, and um, then I would say that a number of, uh, there are a number of activities around the world uh, to create teaching modules for uh, machine learning. Um, and because um, much of what uh, people refer to today as AI uh, really refers to machine learning. Um, so, um, uh, and, and deep learning is the tool that is broadly used um, in, uh, um, in the industry around the world. And there are a number of courses that are available through um, edX. edX is a free online learning pr uh, platform uh, that is, uh, has been uh, developed by MIT. It has thousands of free courses uh, that can help um, uh, with learning. Uh, there are a number of interesting courses with hands-on activities, um, with exercises, and at the end of the course, you get a certificate. Um, other, um, other MOOCs, other massively open online platforms um, like Coursera, also offer a variety of uh, courses. And so for teachers, um, uh, teachers could uh, in some sense train themselves uh, by following, uh, uh, by either um, studying uh, machine learning on one of these MOOC platforms or by participating in summer programs uh, which, are, um, which exist um, to train teachers all around the world and, um, and then once they learn the basics, once they learn the principles, they can bring that to the classrooms. And I believe it's possible. I believe it really is possible uh, to learn the basics and to begin to contribute, but it's never too early to start. So I advocate for starting very early on in kindergarten in first grade. Yes, indeed. So you have a lot of questions going on here about the use of AI tools, even in digital humanities, in culture and so on. So if you can point to some examples to our audience. Well, I'm a huge um, supporter of humanities. And so when I say that we should all learn how to program and how to make things, I don't mean we, we should stop learning humanities. It's so important uh, to, to really understand, to, to know about the arts, to know about history, to know, to know about literature. Um, it's important to know about everything because, um, uh, because, uh, because the more we know, the more creative we become and the more, um, the more productive we become at connecting the dots. And I believe that in fact, um, future technological innovation will be at the intersection between disciplines. Uh, we could have computational journalism. Uh, we could have, we already have digital arts. Uh, we, we can have computational anything, computational history, computational sociology. Uh, now in my own um, uh, uh, work, I have been very interested in connecting uh, technology to the arts. And I have had a long standing collaboration with a dance company in New York. Uh, they called Pilobolus Dance Company. And they're very, um, uh, they, they, they're, uh, they're early adopters of technology. And uh, in fact, together we choreographed the first uh, human robot dance. It was called Seraph. And uh, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a story of a friendship between uh, man and machine. Uh, and it has a happy ending with man and machine becoming friends. And uh, so it's, uh, we've, we've performed this actually 10 years ago in, uh, in uh, 2010, 2000, 2011. Uh, we've had many performances in the New York City uh, area. And then we moved on and we created um, a, 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 per, a participatory um, performance called the Umbrella Project. 
um, where we gave people uh, specially engineered umbrellas uh, that were uh, um, that could um, change the top uh, of the umbrella. They were color programmable. And uh, so people um, would hold the umbrella and push a button and through pushing the button, the umbrella uh, could uh, change uh, the, the top color. And then we put a big camera, on, we, we put a camera uh, across um, uh, high up in the sky and um, we had um, three to 500 people assembled together uh, with their umbrellas and um, they could see what they look like because the camera was projected on a, on a screen that displayed the ensemble. Um, and then we gave people instructions for how to move and how to change uh, the colors of uh, their umbrellas. And together, um, people created this organic performance um, where they were doing local changes, uh, but at the same time, they would see the beautiful images they created all together. And uh, I would say that this kind of um, digitally enabled participatory performance uh, brought a lot of joy to people. So this is a concrete example I have been uh, engaged in, uh, but, uh, but as I said, I think technology uh, can uh, revolutionize fields and can create entirely new fields. Yes, in fact, that's also something which I strongly believe and the entire team here that uh, technology and the uh, ubiquitous use of technology can really enhance people's life. And this is my final take for this one. And I would like to have from you a final sentence and two words. What's your hope? What's your vision for the future? In one sentence, not more. I, Elevator I pitch. To, okay, so I come back to your question, but yes. I, I do want to come back to the, um, to the digital humanities question because I want to tell you that uh, MIT launched um, the new College of Computing uh, in, um, 2000s, uh, in 2019, a year ago. And uh, this new College of Computing has three missions. One is to advance the, uh, uh, the field of computing. The other one is to support computing across the disciplines. And uh, finally, um, to, to, to embrace responsible computing. So all the topics we have been discussing today are critical uh, in the way MIT is uh, reorganizing computing education. And uh, for, for um, enabling computing across the disciplines, we are creating blended majors. In fact, I was uh, intimately associated with creating um, um, a, a blended major on computational urban science. Um, and so this is training uh, the, the new urban planners to be both good negotiators, uh, ethicists, and also technologists. And this is critically important for the development of the future cities. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that I, um, I give you a aspects, complete yes. view of how yeah. we think about, uh, about uh, com uh, computing and other disciplines uh, within our context at MIT. Uh, now, going back to your question, one, uh, one uh, sentence about the future I really your hope, your hope, your personal hope for the future. My personal hope uh, is to have machines help people with cognitive and physical tasks, just like we have uh, our smartphones today, uh, helping us uh, with data crunching and computational tasks. Thank you very much with that amazing thought, uh, which we all hope. Thank you very much, Daniela, for coming live from Boston to Romania. And thank you for all your work in artificial intelligence and robotics, and for, in fact, taking care always about the ethics and the guidelines, and also taking care that uh, humans are not forgotten into the AI world and to the robotics. And thanks for another fellow Romanians who is successful somewhere outside in the world. And see you next time. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor. La revedere. <laughs> La revedere. <laughs> <laughs>